Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on our Reformation Sunday. Uh, we'd like to welcome our uh, visiting pastor today, is Reverend Patty Axel, and her husband Jeff is with her. Uh, we really do welcome them to Redeemer. Uh, altar flowers today were given by Sylvia Wallace to the glory of God. And our lector today is Allison Garnjos. If any of you would like to be a lector, there is a sign-up sheet in the narthex if you'd like to be one. Uh, we ask that you keep uh, Jody Groover, our church secretary, in your prayers. She's home recovering from heart surgery. She seems to be doing fairly well now, but keep Jody in your prayers. Uh, also, next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. Uh, we've asked that uh, you bring in pictures of someone in your past, your parent, your grandparent, a child, someone who is, you've lost in your life, and we'll have their pictures all displayed in the uh, narthex when you come in. Also, your pledge cards are due next Sunday. And next Sunday is a time change. So if you show up at the wrong time, you'll be at the wrong 10 o'clock service. <laughs> so remember, fall back, set your clocks back an hour. Uh, that being said, Patty. It is wonderful to be, be here with you today. I am happy to worship with you and preach to you. Or Actually, I, I ask questions in my sermons, so they're not rhetorical. You get to answer them, and I'll wait for you to answer them. So we'll be good. So, but thank you very much for welcoming me here, and it's delightful to be here to worship with you on this wonderful Reformation Sunday. So, thank you.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, the things we have done and the things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. In the first reading, the renewed covenant will not be breakable, but like the old covenant, it will expect the people to live upright lives. To know the Lord means that one will defend the cause of the poor and needy, as it's stated in Jeremiah. The renewed covenant is possible only because the Lord will forgive iniquity and not remember sin. Our hope lies in a God who forgets. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke Though I was their husband, says the Lord. 
But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the second reading, Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. The second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world will be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <coughs> they are now justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is from the 8th chapter of St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, 
If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not belong to have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. God of grace and mercy, you have set us free to be people of God, to serve and love you through our service and love to all your people. Cast off all the things that do not serve you that we appear to love, so that we may be free to love in a new way. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today, October 31st, 2021, we celebrate something that happened 504 years ago in the city of Wittenberg, Germany. We Lutherans are proud of the Reformation and our hero, Martin Luther. We who live in the 21st century in a free country so often forget the risks that young Dr. Luther faced on that day. Martin was seeking to refer, reform the church from the inside, recognizing the ways in which the church had lost its way. The sale of indulgences, the Latin mass with a congregation that was largely illiterate, and didn't understand anything they heard. Holy Communion, where the congregation received the host, but not the wine. Very little education regarding the Bible and the works righteousness were some of the most glaring differences from what we enjoy now. Buying our salvation, which had been paid on the cross, was to Luther a grave misunderstanding of Christ's atoning sacrifice, and he was determined to teach parents how to help their children understand the Bible, the sacraments, the Lord's Prayer, and the creeds, by making sure these important documents and scriptures were translated into the language of the people, which in that area was German. The risk for Luther was that his message of salvation through God's grace threatened the economic health of the Catholic Church. If people realized they didn't have something to do to be saved, the foundation for indulgences and therefore papal riches was gone. Those who depended on that revenue would do anything necessary to shut Luther up, including excommunication and possibly death. But he stood firm and he stayed with what he believed to be true. The fact that we could read the Bible in our own language understand the sacraments, receive communion, and not worry about doing certain things to get into heaven, we may largely take that for granted. I know I do. We're made part of the body of Christ in our baptism and can take part in the means of grace, weekly worship and holy communion that helps us experience the love and forgiveness of God. We have the heroes of the Reformation to thank for that. Jesus begins his conversation with those who followed him, talking about freedom. Those listening to him argued that they had never been slaves, so they didn't need him to free him. When you think back on the Bible and our Bible history, what were the Israelites doing in Egypt for 400 years? They were slaves. Some selective amnesia that was going on there. Anyway, he responds about the slavery of sin by saying, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So what is sin? How would you define sin to someone who asked you? Any takers? Usually what your mama told you not to do was sin. But any guesses? What sin? How would you define sin? Breaking the law. Okay, breaking the law. Doing what 
uh, makes your conscience uh, get you. Right, okay. Missing the mark of what you're supposed to do. Okay, missing the mark, all right. Oh, excellent answers. I love it. For me, my understanding of sin has sort of morphed over the years. And what I thought to be sin when I was five, and all my mother had to do was glare at me from the choir, and I sat still in my seat and thought, stop doing whatever it was I was doing. <laughs> but now, quite a few years later, I have a different understanding of what sin is. It is the idea that we are separated from God in some way. There is nothing that separates us from God's love and grace. Paul's letter to the Romans that we usually hear in, in funeral services and gives us hope, Romans 8, 38 and 39, reminds us that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is comforting. And as Matthew's gospel reminds us, at the moment that Christ died on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Basically, removing any separation between God's people and God. So the idea that we're separated from God leads us to think, maybe God can't see us doing the things that we know we're not supposed to do. <clears throat> and if God can't, it's sort of like a toddler, if God can't see me, then I'm safe, right? No, it doesn't work that way. If we continue to live as if we are separated, we live in sin. In our baptism, we are invited into a deep relationship with the triune God. And if we live like God is as close to us as our breath, we trust that God is with us, we live in God's grace. We know that God is around us. We know that we are forgiven and loved and adored and walked with and accompanied through life. There is no room in the body of Christ for any activity that we would not do in front of Jesus. And I think I remember my mom telling me when I was maybe in high school that to act as if Jesus was walking with you in every place that you went, with your friends and class and all that. So if you would not do anything that would anger or frustrate Jesus or say anything and I thought that was probably a good, a good thing to remember because you didn't want to upset Jesus. Well, you know, my 14-year-old mind wasn't thinking about the fact that Jesus is always with us and it doesn't matter whether I can see Jesus or not. And what I say, Jesus hears even if I don't see him. So that took a few more years to figure out. So if we live in God's grace, we understand better our relationship with each other to be one of mutual love, respect, and service. Not because we must, and Luther talks about this at length, but because we want to. In Christ, we are free. We don't have to worry about anything with our salvation. But we're dutifully servants to our neighbor, whom we love, and through love, we treat well, we spend time with, we look to serve, we look for any opportunity to lift up the needs of our neighbor. We don't do that because we have to. We do that because we want to. We are saved by grace, not by works of the law. And educated people are hard to control. It is the same now as it was 500 years ago. In the words of Dr. Ginger Barfield, professor of theology at Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary, this scripture passage in John is about, among other things, Reformation, conversion instead of misunderstanding, as well as identity, belonging, and kinship as God's people. Jesus was about Reformation 2,000 years ago. The people of God had lost sight of what it was and what it was like to love and serve God and neighbor and to serve, love, and protect those unable to protect themselves. <laughs> the people in Martin Luther's time had lost sight of what the church was called to do. And today, when we look, when we watch the news in any of our major cities with the uptick of violence and conflict in our families and even conflict in our church families, we need to remember that love for our neighbor 
does not have room for activity that would degrade our neighbor or bully our neighbor or make our neighbor unhappy. So that love that we have for each other should lift us up instead. So how do we do that? How do we restore right relationships with others? This is another non-rhetorical question. How do we restore right relationship? Pray. Pray, okay. When you have a fight with somebody, a friend or your spouse, what do you do? After you go off and solve, maybe, but... You say you're sorry. You say you're sorry. You sit down and say, listen, let's talk about this. Let's talk it out. You come to an understanding because you love that person. Every single person we come in contact with, we should have the same idea about. If I say something to hurt my neighbor or somebody I've never met, I need to take it upon myself to apologize and to find a way to have conversation and right that situation. It shouldn't matter who that person is. Obviously, if I live with that person, it's a little bit more necessary to make sure we get along. <laughs> but it shouldn't matter everybody I should look at as my neighbor. <clears throat> Last summer, the summer of 2020, not 2021, the refrain I heard over and over was, I want to go back to the way we were. I heard that from church after church after church. And I'm not sure that that is such a good thing. Because before the pandemic, we were comfortable. People would come to church, we could sing, we could hug each other. The peace went on for what seemed like hours. And it's like, come on, get back to your side and sit down. But we, who, we need to think about who is not here that should be. We, I don't think we always thought about that. And the ch our ch you know, church is this size and the one I was the pastor of. We didn't live stream. We didn't do Zoom worship. We didn't think about things like that because we didn't have to. But what that has done for us is to bring countless peoples into our midst to hear the word of God, to hear the promise of salvation, to be pulled into a communi communities of faith that worship together. And even though we couldn't worship side by side in the church, we were connected in some way by Zoom. Now, I don't think Zoom, or most of us, ever thought about that possibility a year and a half ago. But then suddenly we were thrust into it. And we had to figure out how to pivot and make church work when we couldn't be in church. <clears throat> now, since this pandemic started, we, we have had to do things differently. We've had to be creative. Those who, act, who have access to our worship have grown considerably. I mean, there are, time, there are congregations who tell me that they get on and check to see who has tuned in for worship. And it's people in another state, people halfway across the country who are friends of a friend who said, hey, why don't you get on Zoom and worship with us today? And if they, you know, it's a lot easier to turn on your computer and sit on your couch with your cup of coffee and your jammies and worship than it is to take a chance of walking the doors to a church of people you have never, ever met. Have you ever cold call walked into a congregation to worship with them if you didn't know anybody in there? It's a little fraught with trepidation. I mean, it's like, it takes a brave soul to go in where you don't know anybody and make yourself at home. So what we did with our Zoom worship was indeed that. We opened our doors and said, come worship with us. And you can do it on your couch with your cup of coffee and your jammies. And it's okay. But if we go back to the way we were, we effectively tell those people, well, we're done now. We don't really care if you hear the word of God. You go back doing your thing and we'll just get back in our church. <laughs> and I don't think that's the message we want to share. So the pandemic has been fraught with tension and misunderstanding as we have many conflicting voices telling us whether to mask or not, whether to vaccinate or not, 
whether to leave our homes or not, whether to worship in person or not. We were, thought we were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and then that darn Delta variant jumped up, and we had to go back to the beginning, or at least a little a more isolated. So how do we do church in this setting? How do we live as the church when so many things we have associated with church are changed? How do we get people to come back into worship with you all here when they are afraid of getting sick or have gotten used to sitting on their couch with their coffee and their jammies? How do you encourage people to come back in and worship in person when they haven't done that, when they've gotten comfortable doing that another way? What does it mean to be church down. Our understanding of freedom from the Reformation is that we don't have to do anything to be saved. Jesus has already taken care of all of that. However, the foundation of our life as Christians, our love for our neighbor, means that we look for ways to serve our neighbor, to reach out to our neighbor, to share the word of God with our neighbor. We are in community with many people who need to hear the gospel. And they need to hear that message of love and grace. Because we have been recipients of God's love and grace, we're compelled by love to share that message with others. Both those we know and love, and those we have never met. It's not a burden if we respond out of love we have in Christ Jesus, and therefore it does not feel like a burden, but a divine opportunity to live into Christ's call on our lives. Does that make sense? Just, you know, Lord, we have been given this great opportunity to reach out. So stretch our arms out, get us out of our comfort places, and help us do just that. You, beloved saints of Lutheran Church of the Redeemer, have a wonderful opportunity in this time of transition to be transformed. You have divine opportunities to do something new. So here are a few questions. These you don't have to answer right now. I want you to ponder them. What have you learned about yourselves in this past 18 months? What new skills have you acquired because of the pandemic? What are the needs of the community around you because of this pandemic? And how can you help meet those needs? How is God calling you to serve in a new way? There is a new world outside these doors that calls for creative new ministries to serve people who are lonely, scared, unemployed, underemployed, and hungry for not only companionship and good news, but food and drink and comfort and maybe a roof over their heads. They need some good news. They need a story they can hang their hope on. What is your story? Are you prepared to share your story? Do you have a 30 second elevator speech that you can say to somebody about why you believe in Jesus? I think telling our stories and being comfortable telling our stories is the foundation for being able to get out in the community and share the love of God. You don't have to beat up people over the head with the Bible. You don't have to tell them they're going to hell and that they're sinning. All you have to do is say why you love Jesus. Now, and I'm going to uh, confess that I took this from an ordination sermon the other night. But he challenged us to come up with six word phrases that you can share. And so I'm going to let you think about that. Can you, th can you come up with six words that would share your faith with somebody else? That's a 30 second or less elevator speech. So think about it. six words. How would you tell somebody that you believe in Jesus and Jesus loves them in six words? And while you're thinking, I'm going to give you some hints. I'll give you mine. God loves you and so do I. We are all in this together. Here's two. Anybody want to try? You can do seven or eight words if you have to. It's okay. <laughs> I have experienced God's um, grace, or I've experienced God's moments. I love that. Perfect. Jesus loves you, this I know. <laughs> Woohoo! We learned that as kids, didn't we? 
<laughs> okay, anybody else? Prayer can make you close. Prayer inspires closeness to God. Okay, wonderful. Oh, good. I want the rest of you to go, when you go home today, to think about that. Think about those six words and think about how you might share your faith with somebody else with a six, six word phrase. Okay? There are so many questions and so many ideas that those questions address. I'm excited about the opportunities ahead of you to call a pastor who will lead you into the future, who will walk beside you and work beside you to do the work of ministry. Pastors don't do it all. You're not calling a pastor to come in and do it for you. Pastors say very, a very important phrase in their ordination liturgy that says, you are called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That means they come in and give you the skills you need to do the work of ministry. And a good pastor does it with you, but they don't do it alone. So think about that as you're, as you're the call committee, as you're looking for people who would be a good candidate. Pray and listen to what God is saying and where God is leading you. Christ has freed you to face a future with joy and hope, and Christ promises to accompany you on that journey. Remember the beginning from Romans, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, and Jesus walks with you on your journey. Luther has given you a legacy for reformation and transformation. And you have the vision and the passion to go forth and serve. That makes me very excited and happy for you. Hallelujah and amen. amen. amen.
the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Set free from sin and death, and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. We pray for all who long for a word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. Inspire congregations to freely and boldly proclaim your love for all people with persistence and hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for your creation, for mountains, rivers, streams, cities, homesteads, and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for our creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who aspire to public office and for all who will vote on Tuesday at local polling places. Pour wisdom and understanding upon all who govern so that communities of justice and peace may thrive. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, or spirit. Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live the abundant life you intend. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and love of you. Guide teaching and learning in confirmation, small groups, Sunday school, youth groups, schools, seminaries, and universities. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. great. We give thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us who dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and work toward life-giving reformation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Today, our prayer requests include Jody Gruber, Bobby, Martha, and Cindy, and Janet Lewis. Please keep them in your prayers this week. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us carefully share that peace with each other. Peace be with you.
break forth in the desert, and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. body and blood of the, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please rise. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.